Hello, Rim to the Most High God, and welcome to another edition of the Kingdom Intelligence Briefing. KIB's purpose is to provide an intelligence briefing for the body of Messiah that will both inform and empower the remnant in the last days. We want you to know that you're not alone. There are more of us than you realize. And the ranks of the resistance against Mystery of Babylon are growing all around the world. This is episode number 215. I'm your host, Dr. Michael Lake, and I'm in the KIB studio today with the love of my life, Mary Lou. Hi, church family. It's so good to be here again. Um, I think we've got some pretty interesting information and some insight on how to, uh, to approach things as we're coming up to Pentecost. Don't you think, sweetheart? I do, and I'm, I'm excited about it. I want to thank everyone for their prayers and uh, and and sharing because I'm beginning to hear feedback from uh, from folks saying, "Hey, uh, I've never heard of your podcast before. I had a friend that shared it with me, and uh, and it's beginning to change my life." And see, all of us have a part. When when you guys pray for Mary and I, it helps us. The Apostle Paul said, "Pray that utterance would be given unto me." And so the prayers make a big part. Sharing it with friends and family and and those that you feel have have a hunger for more of the kingdom of God, really helps get the word out there. Well, that's and why our church family's growing. We're so excited, and we, we, we consider it that. Yeah. We just consider we may not be in the same place, but I can tell you God is knitting our hearts together in a, in a wonderful way to where we can, we can serve him from distance but be in one accord in our prayers. I, re- I remember back years ago when uh, right before I wrote the Shiner Directive that uh, out of my mouth came the prophetic word, from this day forward, I'm going to deal with the remnant wherever they are worldwide. And what we have seen through the books, the videos, and this podcast, Mary, is God is connecting the remnant wherever they are in the world that want to go deeper in God. Well, I, I think it's it's absolutely critical that we have the prayer in one accord. We know that the power increases with each person. One can send a thousand to flight, two can send ten thousand. So exponentially we are as as our church family is increasing and we're we're seeing the you know, the schemes and the strategies of the enemy and seeing how God's given us the information we need uh, to tear down strongholds, we're we're seeing an impact across the world. We're seeing it with our eyes that to me is leading to this last great harvest of souls before Jesus comes back and we can all say together oh Jesus come quickly <laughs> come quickly we want we want the bride to be ready yes and we want the full harvest that Jesus deserves may the mm-hmm. lamb receive the reward of his suffering and that's every soul that he can see saved and brought into the kingdom on planet earth I want to remind everybody about the go therefore uh, conference 2019 in Lima Ohio man that's coming up real quick I'm beginning to get logistical stuff from uh, Dr. Mike Spalding, I'm thinking, man, that's that's just going to be feel like it's just a minute and we're going to be there. Uh, that's July 26th and 27th, and of course it's hosted by my good friend Dr. Mike Spalding. Uh, many of my colleagues are going to be there. Some of them, Mary, uh, oh, I'm excited about this conference. I have I have made friends that I've been on like their podcast and interviews, and I've read their books, but I've never got to meet them in person. Many of them are going to be here, so I get to meet them for the first time. Oh, that's great. And I'm really excited about that. Uh, their website is www.gothereforeconference.com. Really excited about that. Uh, Barry, God's talking, really sharing a lot of things with us uh, this last week, and I mm-hmm. want you to to start and, and share some things God uh, gave you before I jump in. Okay. Well, we were, um, as I was just seeking God on on what he wanted us to do as far as preparing for Pentecost and get our hearts right and, and give, you know, folks some information on uh, what we're seeing. Uh, the first thing, the first thing that he uh, showed me about was the woman with the issue of blood and uh, she, you know, didn't have any hope left and she sees Jesus and she, it says that, that she made her way through that crowd and touched the hem of his garment, which we know now as the Zitzi on the prayer shawl that he had. Um, and, of course, then he said, who touched me because of virtue, the anointing went out of him. He sensed that, and and she was healed. But you're going to talk about that a little bit later in, in your teaching about how what that took for her to press through that crowd because she was essentially in an unclean state. She had an issue of blood. Um and so we're going we're gonna to get to that. You know, that was the very basis of what God started talking to me about is, is what do we have to do to press through to see the fire of God, to yeah. see that mighty power of God come. And so it kind of, you know, went on a winding road for me because God kept reminding me of things that uh, in my healing process. 
and, and some things I've talked about and some things I haven't mentioned, a lot of times I don't want to put something in somebody's mind. You know, if somebody says, you know, hey, was I was a victim of mind control and you put something out there, you might have people think, well, that's happened to me, you know, or, or somehow. And yeah. and I've, I've tried to be real careful about that. Well, it's, but it's, it's, a, it's a very uh, thin line to have to walk on. I remember mm-hmm. uh, years ago when, uh, when I was taking a class on abnormal psychology, and so just being confronted with all these things, half the people had the psychosis they well, were studying when they went through the class. Well, and it's, I think that people that are victims of mind control are susceptible to, uh, you know, information and taking that on themselves because we were we were made to be receivers. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so the thing I'm going to talk about today that I don't think would cause any problems, I just wanted to um, to bring it in to, to – the difficult state that we are in today's society because, you know, a hundred years ago people would in a, in a sanctifying process, you get saved. Um, you know, I don't know how much they taught back then about cleaning out the vessels, but we know today that that's, that's absolutely imperative is when you get saved at that moment, you need to start cleaning house because there are, there are attachments that the enemy can bring through many means that will slow, hinder your, your, uh, healing hinder your delivery all kinds of things so we know that now but but just imagine though in the days of little house on the prairie for lack of a better term there um you know they wouldn't have had this struggle like we do because of technology and what's happened with it and and so i want to tell you about something that i had a memory of um years ago and then i did just a little bit of research that um one of them was on a witchcraft site because i wanted to get uh, something from them that explains something that that I believe exists and this was like on one of their teaching sites which I hate to go on but I just plead the blood of Jesus I looked at it real quick I drew one thing out and so if you'll just bear with me I'm, I'm going to put this all together um, you know the in Luke 17 21 it says the kingdom of God is within us so it makes sense to think that one of the goals of the enemy would be to try to establish his kingdom within there so that God's kingdom cannot fully take over. You know, if there's something fortified, if there's strongholds there, we know that, that you have to bind the strong man mm-hmm. to be able to enter and to clear that place out. And so I think that that one of the things they did with me when I was young was um, a, probably a precursor to what they're doing now on a massive scale. And, um, you know, I, I can tell you that a lot of times when my memories came up, and you can you can verify this, Mike, because you walked through this with me. Before I had a memory, a mental memory of a baby being taken from me. Do you remember I had like several weeks of feeling like I was having um, labor pains? With your ab reactions. And I would just almost double over like I was in a hard labor pain, and I and I started thinking, oh, am I? You know, is there something horrible physically with me? Well, then it it'd go away. I felt fine. I didn't have any other symptoms, and I just praying my way through it. And then it was some time after that. So sometimes you'll have um, like a body memory where something's stored, and that will will come forward before like a, a mental memory. And so there was um, I st- was having these particular headaches. Now I have headaches that I call um, just killer headaches that I think are what are described as split brain headaches where they they do um, they separate your eyes and they bring images into your mind um, at the same time of totally different things to where it it so floods you with the different brain chemicals based on one's fright one's pleasant and things like that that to split split the operation of your mind Um, and so I was having these headaches that were not that kind. That that was a particular headache that I've been able to pray through and get relief from. But there was this one um, really bad headache I was getting at a particular place in my, my brain. And so that went on for a while. And then I remembered sitting in a, a chair. And there was a light beam coming into my eye and the pain associated with that is is really hard to describe but within that light beam coming in were cubes of information and it would be all kinds of things within this cube and it was just one was coming in and then they would send another and and we know that um that we can receive information through our eyes obviously we see everything around us our mind uh, not only 
you know, sees what's there, but then we have the, the cognitive thought process that goes with it. And one of the things that I was looking up was, you know, can I, w- I was trying to see, is there anything I can find that would make me think that that was a real memory? I mean, it, you know, I, most people say, well, boy, if you have the reactions and you're, you're seeing that it's a real memory, but I, I'm just not sure enough because I, I'm not a scientific person to know how things like that can be done. So I was looking up, you know, can 3d, um, images be imprinted and thing and this is one of the the things that uh, just a little section here it says neuroscientists typically think of neural representation in visual perception as occurring at a number of stages of increased abstraction at the retina the image is represented roughly in terms of what you might think of as pixels but it is really just a set of photosensors and attached neurons that are activated due to light hitting the retina in different places at different frequencies and amplitudes now, the reason I wanted to read that is because um, I believe when this was done to me was when I was at Florida on our senior trip. When I came back from that trip, my I, I just started where I couldn't even keep my eyes open. I was so sensitive to light. Um, and so my mom and dad took me to uh, a doctor in a neighboring town, and he sent us to a specialist in St. Louis, Missouri. And so the, what they told me was that I had got an eye infection on this thing. Um, but, he, but later on, I got it again. I, I went through the same thing later on after I'd went through all this, you know, the medicine he gave me and everything. It, it w- was well past this time I went through the same exact thing to where I could not keep my eyes. And this time I went to a doctor in another neighboring town who was, um, he was a medical doctor that had moved in. A uh, horrible experience. He was an uh, an Asian doctor, and he was so mad at me, and just was he was sitting there yelling at me that I couldn't keep my eyes open, and and I was wanting to say the whole reason I came here is I can't hold my eyes open, you know. Um, but anyway, when I went to that um, specialist in St. Louis, he gave me a particular prescription for glasses, and these glasses, I don't, they just kind of had a weird shape to them, and they had a they, it was the first I'd ever heard of where it faded, faded the light. Like when you go out in the light, they'd get darker. Um, yeah, transition type lenses. So anyway, I eventually threw, I threw those away. I just they were bothering my eyes. Just I just felt agitated with them. I ended up just I'm not wearing them. Uh, so that may have saved me from something because I've always I've noticed with the people back in um, where I was raised. And I've noticed this with people I worked with at Fort Leonard. Wood. looking back, I can think there were odd-shaped glasses that people wore. And these odd-shaped glasses, I can look back and I think, man, these were people being affected by this stuff. Um, and so uh, I wanted to bring, bring this up because now this would have been well over 40 years ago. Yeah. Well, we, I, I think one of the things we can look at, too, then this helps um, – share the validity of what you're saying. The most effective way of transmitting information in our current age is something called fiber optics, Mm -hmm. which it is information that is transferred via light. And so I think it's just another form of that same technology. Well, you know, like when I when I had that memory so many years ago, I just thought, well, this just this can't be. They can't be putting cubes of information through some kind of light beam in your eye, you know. And and it was it was so painful. The only way I could describe it is it's like a labor pain where you're you're wanting to push, but this is like it's like something's coming in your eye and you're trying to push it back. You you. Your everything within you is resisting it, and the pain in that was just unbelievable. But one of the things that I um, that I came across also was an article where a scientist said back in 2016 that our brains can store ten times more information than we thought. Um, and so, you know, they're learning. Okay, we can store a lot of stuff. So was was this the beginning stages of seeing what can we put in through video games? Exactly. What can we put in? through a television set that is on high definition now. Yeah, well, that's one of the reasons why I'm so concerned about uh, augmented reality and virtual reality where you're wearing the goggles and 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 the, this, the level of encoding that can be just beyond our normal perception be in there is, is frightening. Mm-hmm. And so, so I, as I was looking through this stuff, I started thinking, um, you know, well, maybe, maybe some of this stuff is real and on this um, – 
on the witchcraft side of things, I found this um, this witch that teaches, you know, other witches. And, and in this, she said that colors are important for making portals to other planes and dimensional realms. The shapes produced by the brain thought process make a change to the energies on every dimension. The geometries are a power that apply uh, to all energy functioning forward or, or toward the same cause for every shape. That's the first line of command nodes, similar to how numbers apply to a computer program. The triangle represents fire. Fire represents change, which makes sense as to why many do not like change as we have to change in fire. Now, I've mentioned the triangle of fire before when I was talking about how they, they use women that are in the Eastern Star with those things to train them unknowingly. And I believe that probably the very rituals that they go through prepare their mind to actually have triangles there and that they that they would be connected in a way to where there can be a portal opened. And we've seen that. I've I've perceived that, and I believe that's bore its, itself out as truth in what we've seen in our services when people would come. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm saying all that to try to um, get people to see that trying to get <laughs> the kingdom of God established is much more difficult now than it used to be. Um, it's uphill battle, isn't it? Well, it is, and, and most people wouldn't even know this, Mike. Most people would have no clue to what's been done through television and through computer games. You know, how many of those, you know, you heard what the witch just said here about the colors. And in all programming, it's totally tied to colors. Usually they're on ribbons, but there will be a different color. So, so this is all involved in occult training and the power that goes with that. And so with reflect, you know, refracted light, all these things are involved. Now, who's going to even think about stuff like that? And so they've been, they've been trying to get this accomplished for years and years, trying to figure out, you know, what can we get in the human mind? What can we build in the human mind? They've got a, a game, I think it's called Tetris, where you build with squares, and I think they're different color squares. Um, there's a couple of weeks ago I was, I was praying for a certain individual, and what God told me is he said, um, they put the initial programming in with a tic-tac-toe grid. And he was talking to me about the X's and the O's and how they represent and when they get into a particular line, just like you do a tic-tac-toe game with the X's and the O's, that the X represents Mithra. It's putting in Mithra worship and all this stuff. I actually found verification for that in an article with someone that for years and years has worked with the program to multiples. And they said not only is there the tic-tac-toe grid, but then there's the Rubik's Cube. Now think about that. That's all those cubes that can be turned with all those colors, lining colors up. So see how they did it? Now they did it all, like with little children, so you'd have to start with a game like tic-tac-toe or something they could, they could see with their eyes and get an imprint of. But do you know what they could do like with the Rubik's Cube did? And internally, if that thing switched to where you had all one color and it would switch you to this, and if you had, had this, it would switch. I mean, you can see just step by step now. So what they were doing, no doubt in my mind, is they were preparing us for like these video games. Oh, yeah. And, and, so, and we know that if you have hand-eye coordination that that you're um, opening up different parts of your mind because of that it's different than just watching something and interacting with it so I and my thought is this guys what are our kids what's already been built in the minds of us through tv now just this is your average person not somebody that was you know had had this stuff done to him like me Um, and I don't even know if it was done when I was at Disney World and they took me someplace. If it was, if I was taken at night, maybe to the Kennedy Space. I don't know where it was done. I don't have a memory of it, but I, I know that's where the I, I thing started with me. So I'm assuming that's connected to that late that whatever that light was that they well, were. Well, when you look, especially the the modern video games, you have hand and eye coordination. Mm-hmm. You have problem solving. You have to a skill figuring out. So you're actually activating both sides of your brain at, at, at different levels as you're going through that game. At the same time, it's it's changing your perception of reality. Uh, there, there are there. I, I think one of the one of the things that we're going to have not only development of memory is that when when you when you develop a new memory, okay, you begin developing that neuron, and it develops something that that reinforces it and protects that that neural pathway called a mylar sheath, and that is done through repetition. Mm-hmm. Okay. How much more repetition do you get than being caught up in an alternate reality 
and you repeat it over and over and over and over again. Uh, there, there, there have been uh, psychologists worried that people are, are going to have a hard time distinguishing, to, distinguishing between that virtual reality and real reality. Uh, in, in fact, even in watching movies, whether it's IMAX or whatever, there are federal laws on the books that limit the number of uh, frames per second that you're allowed to watch because once it exceeds a certain threshold, the brain can no longer di- di- differentiate between uh, you knowing that that's a story and you experiencing that as reality. I believe that, yeah. And so there's there's a real fine line that we're messing with here. With well, these and things. do you think that that might even uh, explain some of the reason, like with when this Game of Thrones, you know, I never watched that, but I'd see commercials for it and stuff like that. It's I guess it's like... Uh, wizards is you think that's what it was or different i know they had dragons and it was very medieval well whatever it was there was anytime something like that is is like a um a fad you know and people just catch on to it and it goes into yeah when it goes into that then when that ceases it's just like people almost go nuts you know they and so it's it's like you stop feeding that kingdom built within them or something i i'm telling you i think this is more serious i think it's why we see so many people that go into trance states. Like, have you ever been talking to somebody and they'll just go like into this stare where they don't blink? And and a lot, I think a lot of people see their kids. Is this linked uh, to to something that that can even pass creating autism? Yeah. Because we know that information and and mind states can be passed genetically. We've seen that proven out. Um, so it's just what what I'm saying is this: the strongholds now are more prevalent than ever. And they're technologically built. They're being yeah. affected by not only the witchcraft part of this. Now, now, and just think about that. Like when women do are on the Eastern Star, and they have them stand on those points, and and there's colors connected with it, and Bible character, all kinds of stuff. Does that imprint on their mind, and does that plate make a place for strange fire to dwell within them? Oh, it can. And I, I think we get so caught up in those worlds, they become more real. I've, I've got in my uh, news aggregator that sends out reports. And it bum fuzzled me because I, I guess with Game of Thrones, it was building to this crescendo. And I guess the ending was an absolute thud. I mean, it was a dud. Mary, there were people having to go through grief counseling over the, over the finale of that show. It's a show. <laughs> well, <laughs> I've, obviously I've not talked, to a lot of people. I have talked to many people in my day that, that have prayed over people in... <laughs> You know what those different shows. We need to shows. pray for Mom, and Paul, Kettle. They're going through a hard. I time. mean, it's yeah. just Mike. It becomes the reality. Yeah. It it somehow somehow this stuff is. I don't know. You know, I can't stand to research much. It just drives me crazy. I'm not a researcher. I don't like reading about witchcraft stuff. I just want to know what button do I push to overcome it. <laughs> you know, like on the computer. I don't want to know all the ins and outs and how that thing operates. Just tell me what buttons to push. And, and you know, the, the how people get wrapped up in this. This is, this is really dated. So this is going back when I was in the military, way back in the 70s and, and early 80s. There were two, you know, so we're, I, I was trained. We're at war with the Soviet Union. It's a Cold War. They're the bad guys. There were two TV shows that the president of the Soviet Union called our president to get the information on. One was how Twin Peaks was going to end with that really weird show, Twin Peaks. And I it never was, watched it either. It, it, I mean, they, they, had, they had really crazy, almost occult stuff in it. And the other was Gorbachev called Reagan to find out who shot Jr. Oh, my word. Well, that <laughs> I do believe that some of this stuff is directly tied to the mind control programming. And yeah. I believe mind control programming has affected everyone, specifically mind control victims. But that was, you know, that was the ground they were all de- determining what could they do on a massive scale. Yeah. I think that's why, like, the people that see the numbers and they'll start seeing the, the times and they'll look at the clock and it's 444. I don't, I don't think that necessarily down. means they're a program multiple. I think that, that their mind is perceiving signals yeah. rather than it affecting them, And which I, I've always said I think it's a good thing. If you start seeing the numbers, you're coming out of any kind of a, a network that's, that's affecting you. You know, the towers, everything there, everything that goes on. I even think that the colors on, on the TV and the things like that, I think they use it all. So, Well, we need to realize that since the, the beginning of the 20th century, with this technological revolution, they have turned planet Earth. We are a bunch of guinea pigs. Yeah. And from generation to generation, they perfected and they test new things. And, 
and uh, we're, we're, we're getting into enter into the crescendo of their watcher developed technologies. Well, and I, the, I said all that to give you some hope and some encouragement here because one of the, now obviously if you, if you can imagine, you know, my, my head being filled with cubes of information for the enemy's use, no doubt, um, all the things that were there, all the, you know, the splitting of the mind and everything, this was one of the prayers that God gave me years ago. He said to, to pray that he would shield me from any kind of a, a broadcast, any anything coming from anywhere. Now, and, and I've said this before on the air, if there's a radio wave coming, a radio wave's going to go. It's one of these, you know, there are the things in nature that we can't do anything about, but God can shield us in a miraculous way. Yeah. And I believe he has to do this. That's why he gave us the the prayer about putting the ask him to put the blood of Jesus over our eyes and our ears as a shield. The the miracle working power of God to shield us is critical for this time. And, you know, it's not one of those things like if you think, well, it's, everything's got to be in the will of God. There are a lot of scriptures that talk about God being our shield that you can stand on. I'm just going to go through them real quick. Just some of them. It's uh, Psalm 3, 3. But thou, Lord, art a shield for me, my glory in the lifter up of mine head. Psalm 28, 7. The Lord is my strength, my shield. My heart trusts in him. I am helped, therefore my heart greatly rejoiceth. And with my song will I praise him. Genesis 15, 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abr- Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Deuteronomy 33, 29. Happy art there, O Israel, who is like unto thee, O people, saved by the Lord, the shield of thy help, and who is the sword of thy excellency. And thine enemies shall be found liars unto thee, and thou shalt tread upon their high places. Psalm thirty three twenty. Our soul waiteth for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. Psalm 115, 9. O Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. Proverbs 35. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. And so the reason I wanted to encourage you with that is we are in a very dangerous time with weapons formed against us made with not only demonic backup, but technology. technology. But what overrides that is just like the fire that's released by these witches when they do all of this stuff with energy and colors and and, uh, structures and geometric shapes. Our God's greater, isn't he? He is. That's 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 why I I, I really believe, Mary. You know, and I've shared this on several shows. You know, when I first got saved, you know, yes, straight is the gate, narrow is the path. And I feel like that was probably about an eight-foot-wide path. When you first start walking with the kingdom, the more that you know, and the more that the, this technology, the enemy, the narrower that path gets, because that's where the safety lies. And as long as we stay in that path and as we mature, I think it almost gets to the place where it's almost like a dog trail, you know? Uh, But the, the importance of it is as we mature, there are higher levels of God's power that we can walk in. Mm -hmm. There are higher levels of God's protection that we can walk in. There is, there is nothing that the enemy can conceive in their mind or try to implement on planet Earth that God has not already seen and already uh, put the answer in his kingdom. It just requires us to go deeper. Well, that's true. Well, and, and you know, like for, for these witches and people that are using that, they're, they're only taking things in creation that God created. <laughs> so they may be able to manipulate some things, but the creator's got all power. Yeah. And so my, my thought is this. As we're preparing for Pentecost and we're asking for the fire of God to refine us, to, to clear the enemy away, to clear out some of this demonic power that is, is so, you know, pressing down God's people, destroying people's lives, we have to first consider that we may well have the kingdom of darkness built in places in our mind we don't know. Just by watching TV, just by playing video games. I mean, that could, that they have may well have uh, perfected. Now think of what they did with me, These this light with the cubes of things. That may be going on on some kind of similar level when we sit in front of a television. It may be going on well, we when know we're, you know, I, I'm just saying, I think that everyone's been affected. So our goal would be if in that situation, you know, if you're struggling, you're struggling and you're thinking, boy, I just, I just can't get on top of things. I can't get the victory of Jesus. There may be something built in your mind. So in that case, you've got if you know that or or believe that could be so, you can say, Father, I open up my mind to you. Clear this place out. I'm I'm yours. And the kingdom is supposed to be built in me. Tear down anything that's in, in my mind that I'm connected to that is not of you. 
and replace it with your kingdom. I mean, just those simple prayers, I believe, will help. Then we then we have to believe that, you know, the demonic's going with it. Because if there's a structure that is not the kingdom of God, you can bet that there's a demonic power that says, hey, that's my ground. So we have to bind that and command it to leave. Then we have to put the guard up. We have to guard our minds. We have to shield ourselves. Um, and that's that's why I've said for so, so many times, some of these things that are on the Internet, there, there is demonic power that comes with these things. I read a thing I was telling you about the other day. In what I was looking for, one popped up that talked about, started talking about how Paul was really a, a mithra worshiper and how he'd brought those things and 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 the, at communion was that. Well, you've taught about how communion goes all the way back to Abraham, Abraham and Melchizedek. Melchizedek. Yeah. So they're, they're getting things out of order. But with that, what I could sense on it was a witchcraft sting to get people to buy it. And so what, if you weren't grounded in the word and you started reading these things on the Internet or you started listening to this stuff and you did not have a proper foundation of truth, man, you're going to get in all kinds of trouble. Yeah. You know, because you got to think about this. This is demonic can be there and technology to affect you. Absolutely. And in, in that case, what those people were engaging in, whether wittingly or unwittingly, was re- was rabbinical reverse evangelism mm-hmm. trying to get uh, people pulled from that into their their uh-huh. modern ver- version of Judaism in which the apostle Paul and even Gamaliel I think will look at what's going on today and saying that's a strange thing how do we get there well and I think we've seen tentacles of that in the Hebraic roots movement that's yeah. what made us so weary as we're thinking man they're going to go to where they renounce Jesus yes and we see many do that uh, I've got reports from one that were also sacred namers that we had a we had a guy come to our fellowship that came out of that in, in a neighboring town, and uh, one of their leaders finally got frustrated and said, "Jesus, Jesus, Jesus! All anybody wants to talk about is Jesus. I'm done talking about Jesus." And I'm thinking, "Oh my word!" <laughs> and and we 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 see we we see that that there's there is. I remember years ago I uh, was talking with Dr. Mal Wilson Gordon College. Of course, he has taught for uh, decades on uh, the Hebraic nature of the church. And he would see when they would get caught up in Talmud and Kabbalah, he said he'd see a vibrant young Christian man end up renouncing Jesus to join a synagogue. And, and I mean, he, he, he shared that with tears, Mary. Oh, and, 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 you know, how, how in the world did with, with us just simply showing, making the New Testament come alive, more alive of who really Jesus is and how he connects to Moses, how in the world did this kid go from this to this, yeah, and and it, it broke his heart, and I, I I think that's that's the danger if we if we don't stay Jesus centric, Messiah centric. Jesus is the epicenter of everything. That's it. The second ring of influence is Moses. Jesus, yeah, then Moses. That's it. That's and then the it goes balance. Off from there. Well, and I think that I think now more than ever, we've got to include in our prayers the knowledge that we're having now with what they've done with technology. Because it's it's one thing to have a demon trying to influence, but it's another thing when you couple that with technology that is totally yep. messing with your head, yep. and and chemical releases and serotonin releases, and to where you may think you're on some kind of religious euphoric uh, yep. deal, and it's really you're being manipulated. Yep. And then you <laughs> add that uh, hormonal disruptors in our foods and water supply. It's, and just, but here's uh, but and here's God's the power good. Is greater. And we have the promise that no weapon formed against yeah. us will prosper. And if you look at it as a weapon, anything that's you know any kind of broadcast they're sending, anything coming over over the waves of the the towers, anything, our God is plenty big enough to shield us. And you know what? If I had not been shielded, Mike, I wouldn't be here. Mm-hmm. He he not only shielded me in a in a physical way against people coming to assassinate us, to harm us, but he shielded me from these things that they obviously prepared my mind to receive. Yeah. The Apostle Paul said, He who has begun this good work in you is able to complete it now. Mm-hmm. He didn't he didn't put a parenthesis in there until they develop the right technology. No. Regardless of what the enemy can produce, Almighty God, who has begun this good work in us as we press more into him and functioning in his kingdom, his kingdom is greater and can finish the work that he started in us. He absolutely can. Oh. And the victories victories directly connected to kingdom. So it makes sense that the old enemy would try to fortify cubes of information if you want in your mind to make sure that your mind can't flow with the kingdom it would yeah. be a disruption exactly and he'll one of the things i'm getting with in my new book with the principality wars is he will he could because pagan practices are polymorphic and what i mean by that is when you when you study 
uh, ancient cultures, okay, whether it was the worship of Apollo or whatever, they're, they're, they're very adaptive that they will, they, will, they will adapt and embed themselves with a veneer of whatever, and some of the practices will change. They, the cultures will do different things, but they observe the same days. And what we have today in, in Christianity, we have a Christian veneer on a lot of pagan practices that take us outside the kingdom, not realizing the dynamic of how occultism, that you know, when, when, you, when you try to study the, the stories of Apollo, whatever, depending upon the author and the culture in which it was written, the same stories will be different because they were hiding uh, different mystery religion information within within the stories, as well as adapting it for that culture. And so we we have we have in in America we have pagan practices with a Christian veneer. We give power to them through their observance, even though our observance may be different than it was two thousand years ago or three thousand years ago. It, it's connected to the day, the time, and all these different things, and some of the basic cultural practices. We have that going on. We have we have them absolutely within our society, uh, using uh, the medium of television, video games, movies, or whatever, to even bring our culture more in line with those pagan practices. Before we had a real thick veneer of Christianity, Mary, it's gotten to where it's razor thin. Mm-hmm. And if we're if we're walking in a different kingdom, our culture is different, our our holy days are different, our uh, the, the the way that we express our faith is different. We're not we're not borrowing from them at all, and the same thing we we need to we need to not let these other things influence us. There comes a point where we move in the kingdom of God. What's in us becomes greater than that which is in the world, and it begins pushing back and changing those around us. Well, and don't you think even with with the issue of abortion, with the issue of um, the LGBT movement, that that there's so much of that on TV right now because not only is it being pushed to get everyone to receive it, there's there's a technology to affect your brain to receive it. Oh yeah, you because to you receive get, it because you get sympathetic. You are programmed at the emotive level because it shuts down your your ability to think logically when you get caught up in the story. So line. when we when we yield to something that that is clear in the word. This is forbidden by God, and and we start to accept that, Mike. That that's going to bring the kingdom of darkness in in those places in our mind. Talk about fighting the kingdom, and and that's when I think, boy, Satan would just love that if Christians start doing that because he's got a direct inroad to hit you with sickness. He's got a direct inroad within your mind, which is so so controlling your body anyway. You know, so so let's say let's say a part of your mind that uh, controls your heart rate. You know, so many they've learned that through the mind control programs that they can directly by affecting your mind, they could cause somebody's heart to stop. They can. Well, well that in my first book I documented it was a Russian virus, and it was called it was called Virus Six Six Six. If that doesn't run up red flags, but in it they could just simply use the flicker rate, and adjusting the flicker rate of the screen to cause the operator to have a heart attack, to have a seizure, or go into a trance. And the premise of that was if they could get the, the monitors that the guys were using in the missile silos, they could get them to trance out or die of a heart attack so that if we would go to war and you have these guys hidden in these nuclear silos waiting for their commands, the very systems that would show them that they need to turn the key and launch the nukes mm-hmm. would be the very systems that shut the human side of it down where they couldn't respond. Right. And we're talking back in the, in the 50s and the 60s that they, they, that they were beginning, in the 70s, they were beginning to develop this kind of programming. Mary, look, just look at how much technology has evolved since that time to today. Well, and look at the state of our society. Yeah. And, you know, and, and there's no way, Mike, that you can get away from TVs and computers. Not in work and, and function, not in this society. I think we need to limit it to the best of our capacity. But um, I, th- I don't think it's, it's realistic to believe that everybody no. just shut it all off. It's too involved in every, you know, even getting the weather, things like that. So this is why these scriptures, meditate on these scriptures about God's your shield. Because we need to have that supernatural uh, shielding for things even in the future yeah. that are beyond what we can imagine now. So start now and believe that God's actually going to sh- put a shield between you and what your eyes see and your ears hear. Start now and meditate on these scriptures because that's what I did. I just started saying, okay, God, this looks impossible that if these people did this to me that they can't just ruin me 
with with stuff that I have no way in the physical to stay away from. I can't put aluminum foil over my head. I can't put, you know, and there's so many people say that they're targeted individuals. This this is the key. Absolutely. He's our shield, and he's greater than anything. The fire we're asking for on Pentecost, Pentecost is what will burn up the strange fire. It is, and I, th- I think what a heart's cry needs to be, because when Jesus said it's in the days of Noah, it'll be in the last days. You know, we, when uh, It seems like so many of us, and I've done this too, when we deal with Noah, yes, it was dealing with the concept that he was genetically pure. But we also go back earlier in Genesis 6 where it said all humanity, because of what the watchers had done, what the Nephilim had done, that uh, men's hearts were continually evil, that they were absolutely consumed with evil. Not, But we need to remember with Noah, okay, so you had that going on where you had, I believe there was there was deep occult things with ley lines and pyramids and, and, and the, the Nephilim and the watchers teaching forbidden knowledge mm-hmm. and all these different things. But they didn't have towers erected. <laughs> Well, they had they had pyramids, but so I mean, they, though, yeah. but they didn't have the technology like we do today. No. And I think the technology of today is trying to reinvent mm-hmm. what they had I in, believe in, in antediluvian days. But in the midst of all this, not only was Noah genetically pure that he remained one hundred percent human, his mind remained pure that he could hear and obey God. And so my heart's cry is, Lord, make me like Noah, that the whole world could be absolutely consumed with evil. But there's Noah. But there's there's that man and that woman that's walking with God that are pure spirit, soul, and body before God. And yeah. and, 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 and if, if Noah could do it in that day with the limited covenant that he had with God, my friends, you and I can do it today. Yeah, by the blood of Jesus, the power of his name. You know, one of the couple of things I want to talk about today, one of them is the process of the fire of God. Now, we always associate the fire of God uh, with the day of Pentecost. Uh, but the Apostle John, when, when he was preaching and ministering. Uh, there are several things that interesting that came out that he said about Jesus that's also connected to the giving of the Holy Spirit. And I want to pick up here in uh, Matthew chapter 3, starting in verse 5. It said, Then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the regions round about Jordan went out to him, being John the Baptist, and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. And he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism. He said to them, Brood of vipers, how's that for a welcome? You know, I want you to feel welcome in my church, you brood of vipers. You know, he, he, he met them where they were really were. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruit worthy of repentance, and do not think, do you say to yourself, we have Abraham as our father, for I say to you that God is able to raise up children of Abraham from these stones. Even now is the, the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear for good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me, which is Jesus, is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. I will, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And everybody wants to stop right there. But he goes on to say, his winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, and he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Now, when we look at this in dealing with the fire of God, in this one prophetic utterance, and Jesus said, no greater prophet has ever been than John the Baptist. And in this, he, uh, and he was actually encompassing the fire of God and with cleansing uh, and, and burning up the chaff with both the ministry of Messiah ben Joseph and Messiah ben David. Now, it'll be on the heavy side with Messiah ben David, but there's several things that we need to learn from this. Number one, we cannot trust in what past generations in our family has done in the kingdom of God. You know, how many times have I heard people say, well, I'm Methodist or I'm Baptist or I'm, I'm, you know what? God can raise up better Baptists out of stones than he can what's going on now. He can raise up better Methodists. He can raise up better Pentecostals. We can't ride the, to- the tailcoats of previous generations, and we have tried to do that. We, there have been great revivals in America. I, one of the reasons I love to go back to uh, things written in the early 20th century or the 19th century is the depth of theological understanding that is there. Most of the stuff we get today is almost cotton candy compared to that back then. That's one of the reasons I shared the, um, uh, the new book series that Tom Horn has put out on systematic theology by uh, Strong. Uh, I, I sure I told Tom I said, "Boy, this really needs to be because there's 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 a depth to that. There's a depth to uh, to uh, B. H. Carroll or Spurgeon or many many others that we do not have today. 
because that generation knew that it had to build its own walk with God. Like Isaac, not only did he have to dig his own wells, he had to unstop his father's wells. And there's no, there's no this coattail writing. In the time of Jesus, they more depended upon Abraham's relationship with God than having their own. And just because you were a Jew, you had it made, or just because you were a Methodist, because you were raised Methodist or Baptist or Pentecostal. Guys, we have this is a personal thing. Messiah changed the entire dynamic. It is personal. It is our relationship with him. There cannot be any coattail writing. That's true. And those that try to, and even if they have spiritual fathers in this day that walked with God, and, and I have seen um, good men of God that had like a Lester Summerall or, or you know, or uh, there are many others that we could say that were, that were balancing portions within their life that really helped them enhance their ministry. Sometimes you can see a marked difference after that, that mentor died because they didn't they weren't able to keep that balance. And we have we have seen that in the life of Smith Wigglesworth. We've seen that in the life of, of so many others that uh, Billy Sunday, so many others, that when that previous generation that really developed that walk with God, that some yeah, they were walking with God, but they were also partly riding on the coattails. When that coattail was pulled from underneath them, they did stagger some. And uh, we we need to realize that this is a personal relationship. You can't Walk in the kingdom based upon Mike and Mary's relationship with Jesus in the kingdom. It has to be your personal relationship. The whole dynamic that Jesus was saying, call nobody rabbi or call nobody father, uh, has no relation to the Catholic church or rabbis because they rabbi just simply means teacher. It doesn't mean I can't call anybody teacher. But within that cultural setting, they were saying, I'm okay because Abraham is my father, or I'm okay because I follow this rabbi, or I follow this teacher. And they were trying to shift personal responsibility to somebody else. When we, when we understand the dynamic of the fire of God and what Jesus came to give, that dynamic is totally out of the window. It's personal. Mary, I can't develop faith for you in walking in the kingdom. My faith in the shields of God cover me. I can't cover somebody else. Now mm-hmm. I can share with them and they can begin developing faith in those shields. And the more they develop faith, the greater those shields become. The, that the, the more that I become intimate with the Lord, the more that their relationship is strengthened. But I can't, I can't do that for somebody else. I can encourage them, maybe be an example, but each one of us, it's an individual responsibility. If, if I have the kingdom of God within me, then I am responsible to walk in the kingdom. It's in me, and therefore it's it's this temple, it's this vessel that's got to walk in it. But one of the things John also shared is that we need to become expert repenters. Now this this is something that I have that I have noticed. Those that um, God uses the most that repentance and humility before God is a lifestyle. Now biblically, when you look at both the Greek and Hebrew of the word repentance, it means sorrow over one's sin and the condition of one's heart. That's, that's the beginnings of repentance. The second is a complete change of mind from pagan to being a walker of the kingdom. Complete change of mental attitude, complete change of philosophy, complete change of cultural practices. Can you imagine in Jesus' day, or in the Apostle Paul's day, you were raised, let's say you were raised in Ephesus. Now, Ephesus was a very strategic place uh, they even believe that the founding of the city of Ephesus was done by the Amazons because it was near where the where the mother goddess had been birthed. Okay, and so that was an entire arena. That was that was their fame. That was so permeated in their culture. Everything was about the worship of Artemis, which was the Greek name, or Diana, which is the Roman name. Mm. Everything in culture that that was the significance of that city. That was its world's fame. And you were raised in that, and then you become a Christian, you begin having to separate from all that. Yeah, you'd have to leave everything you knew. Oh, that's a process. <laughs> yeah. But that, that's what this whole thing of, of changing a mind. And for those that have drifted away, it is a returning back to the ways of God. So repentance is not only for the newbie, it's for the oldie, okay? That we, we all of us have a tendency to drift if we're not paying attention to our walk. Uh, and so all of these, which, whichever level, all these will begin developing fruit. And the Apostle John said, show me fruit worthy of your, showing fruit that you have repented. And the, the more that we grow in Christ, the deeper the repentance goes because 
you know, part of what you shared a while ago about, you know, okay, if I have all this stuff running around in my brain, I need to invite the Holy Spirit. Come in, track that stuff down. Be be the hound of heaven in my life once again. You hunted me down when I needed Jesus. Now, now sniff out all this junk of the devil and help me use the, the, the anointing of God, the word of God to get that stuff out. Mm-hmm. It's part of the sanctification process of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Now, today it is more complicated than it was in New Testament times, if you will. But his power remains the same to get it done. That's right. And so, guys, we, we, have, we, we have got to develop this, this level of, of just the lifestyle of staying in repentance, staying humble before God uh, so that he can do the things. Now, for those that have developed a lifestyle of repentance and walking in humility before the throne of God, the fire of God begins burning off the bondages. That's right. For those who refuse to pent, repent, they become the chaff that is burned. And see, so when we're, that's why whenever the fire of God comes, there's a separating. Mm -hmm. Those that get free and those that refuse because they have hardened their hearts toward God. And we're going to see both with the fire of God. And the fire of God is going to be consistent in the last days. The fire is is going to show who's who. The ultimate uh, manifestation of that fire is actually the Day of Atonement. Those who have not humbled themselves before God when Messiah returns will be koshered because that's also part of what he's talking about here. Those, but, but Mary, by the time we get to that place in history, everybody that could be saved has been saved. Those that align themselves with the enemy of God and have lost the ability, they can't be saved. And so when we get to that point in history, you're either saved or you're not. And the fire's going to come, and it's going to set the Christian free, and then it's going to get rid of the Antichrist horde. And I think we'll see the beginnings of that start before Jesus gets here. Oh, yeah. And I think with every revival that comes uh, to a certain degree. This next thing God began talking to me about is the dynamic of determination. And this is dealing with the woman with the issue of blood in Luke chapter 8, verses 40, 40 through 48. And what's interesting, it's almost done as a side note because there's a, there's a ruler of the synagogue named Jairus whose daughter is sick. And so Jesus, in the midst of this throng, and if, in, if you've ever been in the midst of a throng, I think the first time I ever really, really experienced it was the first conference that I went to down in Denver with Gary Sturman and all them because you had two, 3,000 people and everybody had crammed in. It was before they had the first opening of the doors. Okay, now we had went down and set up our tables. And Derek and Sharon Gilbert and I kind of found a little corner we could get in for relief, and we began talking with the kingdom. Uh, and you, you look up, and there's all you see are eyes, cause, eyes and ears because everybody was listening to what we were talking about. We were just having fun. But, Mary, I don't think you could have dropped a pencil and not had, and it, it wouldn't have hit the ground because people were so packed together. It was to the place where um, it's like, okay, I, I need air. Yeah. And so, I mean, pack that. That's what a throng is, okay? Jesus has this throng around him where you couldn't have dropped a pencil, and so there's people touching and pushing him, and he's trying to, he's trying with Jairus to push his way to get to Jairus's home. In the midst of all that, we enter into another story. Um. Uh, I want to pick up here in verse 43. Okay, so we, we dealt with Jairus. He's in a throng. Now a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years who had spent all her livelihood on physicians but could not be healed by any came in from behind and touched the border of his garment. Now, okay, you can't even get a pencil. This woman had to get on her hands and knees, and she had she to crawl. She said really pushed. Absolute <laughs> yeah. determination. Now when you understand the laws of Moses, Someone who had uh, an issue of blood meant also the possibility of them having an infectious disease. Mm -hmm. And so the protocol was they could not be in public and to do so because you so jeopardized uh, the community. I mean, somebody that had an issue of blood, let's say if it was bubonic plague or whatever, then pressing into that throng Within a week, that entire throng could have been dead. They could have killed an entire community. Well, so and back then they didn't have lessons in microbiology. No, they so didn't. That's why so God, they would have known about that. That's why God's 
statutes were so important. He didn't say, go into this big science lesson to somebody and say, there's these little tiny germs you can't see and stuff. He just said, if if you have an issue of blood, do this. If you have this, do and He was if just giving leprosy, directions. Do right, this. right. Or the others, some of them kind of seem kind of weird to us. It's like, thou shall not have woolly linen, is what it talks about the blending. They have discovered that if you take wool and blend it with the linen back then, linen was not made of cotton, it was made out of flax. You put those two together, it'll create a static field around you that will give you chronic fatigue syndrome. So instead of God telling them about electromagnetic fields and how the static mm-hmm. can be created by this particular combination, God just said, don't do it, you'll be all right, you know, because he, he wasn't going to give them a science lesson. Well, they, they so, had no frame of reference for anything scientific back then. No, they didn't. <laughs> and so... Uh, but God, dis- uh, and that's why there's such brilliance in the commandments of God. You don't have to know the science behind it to mm-hmm. benefit from obeying it, which is just so cool. Um, so she she was she jeopardized her own life pressing into this throng, and we we missed the point of touching the the border of his garment. The what we know, you know today is called a prayer shawl. Back then it used to be the outer coat, and the, and the outer coat had uh, the outer coat had fringes, and it had the zitzi, mm-hmm. okay, the blue cord. She reached out and grabbed and touched that. And when she did, she was instantly healed. Now, I want you to notice that until she was healed, Jesus acted like he didn't even know she was there. And it said, he said, immediately, it says, immediately her flow of blood stopped. And Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied it, Peter and the others said, Master, the multitude throngs you and you're asking who touched me. <laughs> It's like, Jesus, tell me who hasn't touched you in the last five minutes. But Jesus said, somebody touched me, for I perceive that power going out from me. We need to understand that this woman was determined. It's her own personal determination. Sometimes you got to fight to get the answer. Yeah, and it's and, not easy. Usually it's not easy. <laughs> in, the, in the age of microwaves and drive-up restaurants and information so readily available on the typing of a yeah. keyboard, we don't have the patience to have determination to press through. But some of the greatest things require us to be determined that we're going to press through until we get the answer. And it's not pressing through to a individual human. It's pressing through to Jesus. Mm-hmm. Now, what I have seen... Uh, she she had daring determination to do what was ever necessary to get to Jesus. The issue of blood made her unclean, making her in public. The, uh, the, she shouldn't have been out in public. She did it anyway. She touched his zitzi, and this goes back to Malachi 4. Two. Why did she grab that? Number one, a true prayer shawl, the zitzi, have the blue thread. Mm-hmm. Okay. That represents Messiah, that the only way you can walk in the commandments is Messiah. But in Malachi, it says that when the son of righteousness comes, he will have healing in his wings. And that part of that outer court coat is called the wings. So her faith got a hold of the anointing. <laughs> got a hold of the anointing. Her determination for an answer placed a demand on the power of God to flow, even though Jesus, as far as his humanness, unconsciously was aware of that need until the power flowed. Mm-hmm. Well, it didn't go, you know, the anointing doesn't leave you for no reason. I've always said that. Well, if absolutely. the anointing's going, God's doing something. <laughs> Guys, our determination for deliverance, healing, and to become closer to God, etc., places a demand on the kingdom, and the kingdom will respond. And Mary, what I have found in my own life, and both of us have seen this, we're, we're pressing in for an answer. We're determined to get an answer. And out of the blue, uh, we'll, uh, we'll stumble across a book. Out of the blue, we'll find the right podcast. We'll have the right message. Or many times, the right messenger. And many times, it was somebody that we wouldn't even expect to be a messenger that would say something or do something that be the piece of the puzzle that we needed to implement mm-hmm. in our lives for that determination to become a reality. Mm-hmm. But it's the determination that caused the kingdom of heaven to go into motion for, in our behalf. And determination is illustrated through making any change, doing anything to align with the kingdom, even if it means changing everything in our lives. Now, that is something that uh, the body of Christ has has lost that message. We want the kingdom of God to go into operation and us not have to change anything. Well, and that's a, one of the dangers of the prosperity message. It's just you got you just got to give this money, and then everything's going to be okay. Like, like money's going to drop from heaven. And when you, when you go back and you examine uh, the truth about a lot of those stories, okay, 
what happens, okay, I'm a contractor. I'm trying to seek God. I give an offering, but at the same time, I'm pressing into God. And so the, because I'm pressing into God, God begins blessing the works of my hands. That is the biblical mandate. God always blesses the works of my hands, and that causes me to prosper. Mm-hmm. But it, we, we have taught it like money's just going to rain down from heaven. It doesn't work that no. way. It, 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 there, when God blesses the labor. Well, and part of that part of that growth is so important to your sanctification process because God builds you little by little. Yeah, you're faithful with this, and then He increases. And just thinking that something's just going to fall out of the sky and this big fortune, look how much of your growth you would leave behind if that happened. Look how much of the refining process is involved in you, little by little, having faith. And seeing God bless this, and, and you making changes, and then He can bless this. And well, contrast that because that is the equivalent of winning the lottery. Mm-hmm. How many people have went from poverty to riches with the lottery, only to be bankrupt within five years, or destroying their lives because you you can't get this without having God position you in a place, spirit, soul, and body, to be able to walk in that level and maintain and maintain yeah. it. And that's the next thing I want to deal with this is maintaining our gains because. We tend to go back and forth now. Uh, Peter and Second Peter, and uh, verses five through eleven deals about. I believe building. Remember, they had to go back and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem for protection. But if you've ever seen a stone wall, you'll have layers. It's not just you know. It's not just one big stone. It's it's layers of stone. So you'll the the Bible says it's precept upon precept, line upon line. We go from faith to faith. We go from glory to glory. And so the Apostle Paul is dealing with this. And in verse 5 he says, But also for this reason give all diligence. Now what's interesting in diligence, in this, in this he uses diligence twice. But what gets me is the first time he says giving all diligence, and then when he gets down here even further he says, But even be more diligent, how can you be more diligent than all diligent? It's because you've matured in the diligence. The diligence is the, is the key that opens up a lot of stuff for us. And it says, and for this reason, give all diligence to add to your faith virtue, uh, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. But if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even in blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly in the everlasting kingdom of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so here he uses diligence twice. And diligence in the Greek is spude which means the haste to make haste, to be earnest, diligent, earnest in accomplishing, promoting, or striving after anything to give all diligence, interest one, uh, oneself most earnestly. And so he said, basically it's make this a top priority. And what I have found is when God, when God builds a layer of our protection in our life, now I'm not going to be perfect in faith. I'm not going to be perfect in virtue. I'm not going to be perfect in in knowledge. I'm not going to be perfect in self control. Each one of those are a rock in that first layer of my wall, and then God says, "Okay, you're you're at level number one with those," and then the Holy Spirit takes us back and He increases our faith. Our faith in God begins to increase on in what we have just built, and then to that we once again we add a greater level of virtue, a greater level of knowledge. And so somebody that continues that, and you build layer upon layer, with each layer comes a greater depth. Because what I, what I have, what, one of the things I have had feedback from people when they read this, they just give up because I'm, I'm barely established in faith. How can I add virtue? But when you, when you understand the building of that wall, that my, my faith is greater now than it was 10 years ago. The virtue that I have now, because I've disciplined myself, I've, I've repented, I've gotten rid of so many of my sinful ways, my virtue is greater. I have greater self-control now than when I did 10 years ago. And so he said, that's why he says, even more diligence. Keep on building. You'll get to the place. You know, it's, it's hard to keep out the enemy when your wall of protection is only two foot tall. 
That's why, that's why you seem to be fighting more because he can easily get over the wall. But when we keep building, Mary, when we're diligent and we add to that even more diligence, that when you have a six or seven or eight foot wall, Mary, it becomes really hard for the enemy to get through. That's they, true. They, they begin having to build bulwarks to get through. Well, and in that, in that building, you're gaining strength the whole time. It's like Absolutely. if you do exercises, your muscles get stronger. That's right. Uh, moving in, in spiritual dynamics is the same as, as weightlifting. The more that you do it, the stronger that you get. That's why uh, believing God now, that understanding the dynamic of his shields to protect us, it is better to begin developing it now than when the beast system comes into place. Don't try to develop it. Then you can't approach Satan's graduate school level stuff with kindergarten garden level faith. That's why that's why God is awakening the remnant now. He's preparing the remnant mm-hmm. now. He is adding an anointing to supercharge our growth, to supercharge these things. And with each layer, Mary, also comes a greater level of freedom because as I as I as I finish that one row. The whole way the Holy Spirit has been dealing with me, and I've been throwing off the, the rocks out of my pocket. I've been getting rid of bondages. I've been getting rid of these things. And as I start the next layer to begin this again, everything God does, God does in cycles. The feasts are in a cycle. They're cycle of sanctification. Mm-hmm. That that every time I, I start the next row, I am stronger than I was before. I, I can add weights to my to my bars in, in the gym, if you will. Because my faith has become stronger, because my faith has become stronger, my virtue has become deeper, because my virtue is more real, my knowledge of the word becomes deeper. And we and so there's and so he, God is trying to systematically work us toward maturity so that we could be like Noah in the day of Noah, that not only are my genetics pure, but my soul is pure before God that I can that I can commune with God and I can hear God mm-hmm. and that he can he can empower me to build whatever kind of ark or whatever else he wants me to do that even though the whole world and Mary that was to the place that you read the word because of the evil that was that was set in the hearts of men God it even grieved the heart of God that he had ever made Adam I mean that's some rough that that is some rough stuff well you kind of wonder if he's not looking down now yeah <laughs> and we're getting to that place again. But in the midst of all that, because Noah knew, understood this dynamic, that Noah found grace in the eyes of the mm, Lord. And that's such a wonderful statement. <laughs> and see, that grace is not, is not an excuse to sin and get away with no. it. The grace empowers the shield. That's right. Because grace is the power to overcome. Grace is the, is the power when you get saved. You know, the, the Holy Spirit begins dealing with you. And it, it's it's unmerited favor, but at the same time, he gives you the grace to overcome your past to find the cross and to find the completed work of Jesus. And then, as he continues, and we continue to grow in grace, now he he begins giving us overcomer grace to overcome our past, to overcome our mistakes, to overcome what the enemy's doing. He gives us ref, uh, finisher's grace that we finish what we start in the kingdom. There's all different types of levels of grace, and the more that we grow in that grace the greater the shields become. Well, there you go. You're preaching, babe. And, and God has called us to be deep in faith, deep in grace, deep in his power, deep in his kingdom. Mary, uh, for everyone that listens to this, my, my heart's cry is that you be so deep in the kingdom, the devil has got to use binoculars to find where you are. Yeah, the walls of the kingdom just keep thickening. <laughs> they keep thickening, and you're, and you, you, you're, 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 you're so far, far in the out. distance. Yeah, he can't you know. get close to you. Be, be, be on the back patch where he doesn't have that easy access. He has to hunt for you. Make him, make him get a telescope. Make him get something. Don't, don't be sitting there dancing back and forth across your two-inch fence, okay? We, we want to be founded in Christ. And with that determination, if we have the determination that I'm going to be free, that I'm going to be whole, that I will change whatever I need to change to come in line with the kingdom of God. The kingdom will go into operation to ensure that you get the pieces that you need, of the information that you need, of the anointing that you need. It'll, it'll come from many different sources. And, let, and, and, and because of our determination, we'll sense where Jesus is. Mm-hmm. 
That woman did not pay any attention to the hundreds and hundreds of people that were in that throng. She pushed right back by the apostles, didn't give them second notice at all because she was zeroed in on Jesus, that that determination enabled her to zero yeah. in on Jesus and to forget about everybody else. She didn't care else. what anybody thought because I can guarantee if any, they probably knew in that that group there that she would have, have had this. And so they would have backed off of her like she had the plague. And, and so and she they, just they kept going. They could have called for her to be stoned yeah, to death yeah. because of what she did. And, and she pressed through to get to Jesus. Yeah, God can help us have that determination. Oh, man. And guys, this is a lifetime process of building that wall. That's right. It, it's and, and guys, even once you get, let's say God pulls down the mind control, you're just beginning because there's going to be levels of freedom, levels of grace, levels That's of right. faith, levels of love, levels of, of learning how to walk in the kingdom. And you may have to moan and groan a little bit like me and Mike as we're doing this session of, of exercises we just found out. And we're doing squats oh. and our, our bodies are yelling. Aren't they? <laughs> I did not realize... I did not realize how to, out of shape I was until the first day of, of doing, and it was the simple thing of doing two sets of 10 repetitions of squats. The next day, oh my. It's like something has happened to my thighs. They don't want to work. Well, that shows us that we got to do more of this stuff. And I, I think it's the same, the same, because, you know, in weightlifting, they say no pain, no gain. Sometimes there will, there will be a, displeasantness as we change and deal with issues when when god yeah. when, when god is is excising a wound and and to clean it out that can be unpleasant but it's for our healing mm-hmm. well then feel good and a splinter comes out either but you got to get it out before you, you get it out. we don't we don't want spiritual gangrene to set in we, we yeah. want that cleansed and then only then uh can can the healing process begin mm-hmm when the contaminants have been pulled out. And uh, sometimes it's unpleasant. But let me tell you something. When you get on the other side of it, you feel like a new man. That's true. Or a new woman. And that's where we're headed, guys. Have determination. Determine in your heart, I want Jesus. I want his kingdom. I want freedom. I'll change what I need to change. I'll do what I need to do. But I am determined to touch the hem of his garment. And I'm determined to have that anointing flow that I can be healed That's it. and restored and learn how to see those shields of the Lord built in my life for the days ahead. Father, give us the grace to do it, we yes, ask. we ask for it, Lord. In Jesus' name. Hi, friends. Pastor Mike Spaulding here to tell you about the Go Therefore 2019 conference. This year's gathering will be at the University of Northwest Ohio Event Center July 26th and 27th. The conference will conclude Sunday, July 28th at Calvary Chapel of Lima. This is the largest gathering of acclaimed Bible teachers, researchers, and prophecy experts anywhere in the United States. Here's our speaker list. Author, Bible teacher, and host of the Kingdom Intelligence Briefing, Dr. Michael Lake. Bradley Dean, host of Sons of Liberty Radio. Author and founder and director of Peacemakers Outreach, Dr. John Diamond. Russ Dizdar of Shatter the Darkness Ministries. Coach Dave Dobbenmeyer of Pass the Salt Ministries, pastor and author Dr. Carl Gallups, researcher Carl Tykrib, publisher of the Wisconsin Christian News, Rob Pugh, author Douglas Woodward, prophecy expert John Hallett, David Arthur of Alphabet Man Ministries, filmmaker Tom Dunn, researcher David Paxton, cybersecurity and artificial intelligence researcher Mark Trump, Created Equal founder Mark Harrington, the last evangelist filmmaker David Hevener, author, researcher, and lecturer, L.A. Marzulli, author, Chad Schaefer, British filmmaker, Mark Sutherland, pastor and musician, Leighton Howerton, former combat veteran and author, Jamie Walden, and of course, me, Dr. Mike Spaulding. Tickets are only $59. You can secure your seat for the Go Therefore Conference at this website, gothereforeconference.com. This event will sell out quickly. Ticket and hotel information is at the conference website. Go thereforeconference.com. Hope to see you there. Oh, 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 oh,